continue and complete our study in the book of Jonah. Jonah, many have heard of the book of Jonah. Multitudes of those, even as Christians, think about Jonah as being that one that was swallowed up by the great fish. Multitudes uh, think that as an allegory or just a myth. And as you've heard me say, those that think it's a myth are just mistaken in that realization and thought. And many use it simply as a children's bedtime Bible story and not realizing the truth of it. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 39 and following, Jesus himself identifies it as being a true story, a true biblical text in the book of Jonah. Jonah, the fourth chapter, concludes our study. Not but 11 short verses in the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah, but it is the culmination of what we find in the study of these four brief chapters, one of those that multitudes fail to recognize the power and the authority and the depth that we need to learn. The book of Jonah, I've shared with you before, and may I do a little brief recap of the book of Jonah. And someone has said, and may I quote, the first chapter, Jonah's disobedient and afflicted. Chapter 2, Jonah's praying and delivered. Chapter 3, Jonah is recommissioned and is powerful. Chapter 4, Jonah is perplexed but not forsaken. And may I add to that, Jonah's perplexed and angry at God. Angry at God, but yet not forsaken of God. The book of Jonah opens with God's call for him to go into Nineveh and preach what he's going to tell him to preach. Jonah decides that he's simply going in the opposite direction. And as I've said so many times during the course of this brief study in the book of Jonah, he, before we condemn Jonah, we need to understand that oftentimes God will call us to do something, speak to us through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, and we reject it and disobey, decide we're going to do our own thing and go our own way. Jonah disobeys. He runs and refuses to do what God said. In fact, Jonah admits that he's running from the presence of God without the realization that there's no way you can be outside of the presence of God. Jonah, while aboard the ship, uh, and the ship is tossed and turned with the winds that God had produced to get his attention. The sailors said, what should we do with you? When they discovered Jonah was a backslidden preacher that was causing the problem, they tossed him overboard, as he said. And once that happened, the uh, storm ceased, and the sailors were all right. But then God had prepared a uh, fish submarine. For Jonah, and he was on board the fish submarine, and there he repented of his sin of disobedience. God delivered him, gave him a second chance, called him again, recommissioned him again in the third chapter. Jonah is obedient to what God says to do. He goes into Nineveh, and he preaches what God said to preach. As a result of that, all of Nineveh, and historians tell us there's a million plus uh, individuals in the city of Nineveh, uh, one particular theologian said more than likely about a million and a half. And according to the last chapter we're reading in a moment, in the last few verses, 120,000 children that did not know the left hand from the right hand indicating their immaturity, about 120,000 children with a total of about a million plus people, all including the leadership in Nineveh, turned to the Lord. And keep in mind, those in Nineveh were the Assyrians. They were wicked, vile, evil people. And Jonah simply did not want to go and preach the gospel as God would give him to that one that was the enemy. And as we find in the fourth chapter, Jonah realized God's mercy and God's grace and God's long-suffering. And he felt that he knew that God was going to deliver them. And so he is repelled and re, uh, re, uh, repulsed by the fact that God did not destroy the Ninevites. And here in the fourth chapter, we find twice clearly stated that Jonah was angry with God. So I want us to know uh, three things about this, and then we'll read the text. We see the anger of Jonah recorded in verse 1, 2, and 3. Secondly, we see the apathy of Jonah reviewed in verse 4 and 5. We see the arrogance of Jonah revealed in verses 6 through 11. Out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word, would you stand please as we, as I read, audibly follow with me in your scripture silently in the book of Jonah, the fourth chapter, 1 through 11. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, dost thou 
well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there was made him a booth, and he sat under it in the shadow till the, he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that he might be, it might be a shadow over him to, uh, to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad for the gourd. I want you to notice some differences now. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise, God prepared a vehement east wind, and uh, the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well. I to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for that which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, the great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? Thank you, and we may be seated. As we think on the subject, angry with God, Question mark. Angry with God? Question mark. May I simply begin by asking the question? You need not say amen or oh me. But we need to ask the question, how many of you have ever been angry with God? How many of us have been angry with God? Now, most of the time, most of us do not want to admit that. But at some point and some time, something has happened. Something is going to rise. We'll talk about that during the course of this message that will cause an individual to get angry with God. And that's not commanded in the Scripture. God did not commend Jonah for his anger toward God. But I want us to notice, first of all, the anger of Jonah recorded. Notice the attitude recorded in verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Remember, Jonah had... Uh, first uh, refused and rejected the call from God. Jonah had run from God. Uh, Jonah had a second chance, and God had uh, opened the door and given him an opportunity. And Jonah had preached 40 days, and Nineveh shall be uh, destroyed, overthrown, judged. And that's what he had preached. And as a result of his preaching, the people had heard, the people had heeded, the people had uh, repented, and they had gotten saved. Forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people heard the message. They responded to the message, and they repented. Now, I've said many times down through the years with this text, most preachers, most evangelists, most of those in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in preaching and seeing a great crowd respond, would have been rejoicing over the response of the people saying yes to Jesus. That wasn't so with Jonah. Jonah was not uh, the typical evangelist of what you would find in the evangelical circles today where we talk about soul winning and evangelism. You would think that Jonah would have been pleased. Jonah's attitude was he was displeased rather than being delighted. He was uh, rejecting what had happened rather than rejoicing what had taken place. And may I ask the question, who is Jonah angry with? Who is he angry with? How does he get angry and what is causing it? And the question is, have we ever been at any point in time angry with God? Have you ever been angry? Perhaps you prayed uh, a prayer fully expecting God to do something. Perhaps you prayed a prayer and somehow, some way, you thought that God had subtly and so quietly and so uh, uh, benevolently said, I'm going to do that. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I prayed and asked God to do something, and he told me clearly, I'm going to do that. I'm going to answer your prayer, and I'm going to do exactly what you've asked for. Uh, maybe it's a job, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a health situation that you have sought God to heal and give health and strength and renewal, and that didn't happen, and you got angry with God. I'll never forget, several years ago, sitting in the hospital room uh, with an individual that had lost, recently lost her 30-year-old daughter. Listen very carefully. This illustrates what we see in this text. Her daughter died just a few uh, months before this event in our conversation. She said that I had prayed and asked God to heal my daughter. I had prayed fervently and gone before God. I'd read the scripture. I'd gotten on my knees and I'd pleaded with God. And God clearly, definitively told me that he was going to deliver her and heal her. But she died. She said, I'll never read my Bible again. I'll never go to church again. I'll never pray to again. Again, I'll never believe God on anything again because he did not do what he promised me he was going to do. 
There's a problem with that mentality. God's the one that's sovereign, not man. God's the one that makes the determination, the decision on what's best to get our attention. Listen very carefully. God is going to get our attention, whatever it takes, whatever mechanism and whatever means, whatever he has to do, he's going to get our attention that will be sold out, surrendered unto his lordship in our lives. And here is Jonah, as a result of what God has done, you would think that he'd be rejoicing, but he is angry with God. May I remind us, many will get angry with God when things don't go the way they want it to be. Uh, Jonah's having what you'd call a pity party. Jonah's having what you'd call uh, a bent out of shape condition because of his displeasure with what God has done. And yet he's not responsible for anything other than being the mouthpiece of what God had said for him to do. He did that, but he's angry that the people repented and turned to Christ, turned to God, and made a decision to be obedient to the message that he had preached. Not only do we see the attitude recorded, but I want you to notice the alibi revealed. Notice Jonah's alibi. He's blaming God. Listen carefully. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Now listen to what Jonah is saying. Jonah said, God, it's your fault. God, you caused this to happen. God, he, rec he recognized that it was because of God that the people had repented and turned to God. He realized that. I give him credit for that. But uh, may I remind us, he is uh, saying that, God, you caused the anger. You caused me to be mad. Uh, Jonah's excuse, Jonah's rationale, Jonah's alibi is that God has done it some way. Jonah blames God because God's attributes of grace and mercy and patience and kindness and love. Now, he recognized God's attributes and love and kindness and mercy and grace. But because of God's attributes, he said, God, because of your attributes, because of your love and grace and mercy and kindness, you've allowed this to take place. What he's saying is, God, because I preached and you worked in the hearts of these people, it's your fault, it's your cause that they turn to you and I am disappointed. Disappointed. Now listen, he's disappointed and in his disappointment he's angry because he wanted to see uh, the Assyrians, those in Nineveh, he wanted to see God destroy them rather than saving them. And that's a reverse of what we would think of in evangelism today. May I ask the question? He says, God, I told you why I did not want to obey you. He says, God, I've already said this and I'm saying it again, it's because of who you are. My question is, what's your excuse? What's our excuse? It's easy for Satan to delude and deceive and to blind us into thinking somehow, some way that God is responsible for those things that take place in our lives that sometimes are distasteful, sometimes are uh, harmful, it seems, on the surface, but God is working in and through each and every circumstance that he might get our attention, that we might be sold out and surrendered to him, that our lives might be useful in the hands of God. Jonah's angry. He's now attempting to defend his disobedience to God, trying to blame someone else for the sin of disobedience. By the way, this first started in Genesis 3. Eve blamed it on Satan, the serpent, and uh, Adam blamed it on the woman. He says, God, it's the woman you gave me that caused me to sin. It's a typical sense of we've got to find somebody to blame what we do in our disobedience before God. Somehow, some way, we have defaulted to that in all of humanity, and it ought not to be in the household of faith. It ought not to be especially that we blame God or anyone else for what God is doing to get our attention. Notice not only the attitude recorded and the alibi revealed, but I want you to notice the appeal recited in that third verse. Therefore, therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech you, that word beseech means to beg. He says, I plead with you, God. I beg you, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is so angry, he just wants to die. Now listen very carefully. You can go back to Job chapter 1 and 2 and find that Job was saying, God, why wasn't I bo uh, stillborn? Why didn't I die at birth? But it wasn't because he's angry with God. It's because he was deeply uh, depressed as a result, a result of losing his flock and losing his family and losing his fortune in about a 45-minute period of time as you study the book of Job. And Job was not angry. He was disappointed and in that disappointment and in that uh, uh, disillusionment because of the loss of all that he had, he is in depression and it's out of a heart of depression. Jonah here is not depressed. He's been out of shape with God. He's been out of shape with God. God didn't do what he thought God ought to do is the bottom line of that. And here in his appeal, he's saying, just let me die. 
Just let me die. And in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8 and 9, we find some words that might let us understand a little better. The Scripture says in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8 and 9, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than proud in the spirit. Be not hasty in the spirit to be angry, for anger resisteth the bosom of fools, resteth in the bosom of fools. Someone said, and I believe it, that anger is the acid that eats the cup that holds it. A person can be so angry that it literally destroys the individual because of his anger and the hostility that rages within. And Jonah is in that position. Jonah is one that is angry because of what God has done in his patience and in his love and his mercy for those that he could have destroyed, but they turn to him. James chapter 1 verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. That word wrath is thumos, white hot anger. There needs to be a gauge, if you please, in the heart and the life of an individual in relationship to that thing of anger. The scripture says in Ephesians, it's all right to be angry, but to sin not. And in that text, it's talking about we need to be angry over sin and not let that be an anger that causes us to sin because of the anger. It's all right to be angry. In fact, every Christian ought to hate sin and be angry at sin, but we ought not to let the sun go down on our wrath, the Scripture says. And here's Jonah that is angry. He's been out of shape. He's appealing that God just let him die. Anger is dangerous, and anger becomes that acid that eats the life because of the anger within. Not only do we see the anger of Jonah recorded in verse 1, 2, and 3, but I want you to notice the apathy of Jonah reviewed in verses 4 and 5. Listen to this fifth verse. Then Jonah said to the Lord, said, then, the, then Jonah said to the Lord, God is speaking to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it, in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah says, Lord, just let me die. Then he would sit back in just an apathy, watch to see what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to get out of the uh, circle of influence. I'm going to get out of what is being done. I'm simply going to sit back. He says, my anger, Lord, I'm angry. And because of that anger, it's preventing his joy over what's taken place in Nineveh. Out of that anger, he doesn't delight in the Lord. So I want you to notice a couple of things. Notice the argument that is registered. The argument that is registered. He's angry over the circumstances, and that anger prevented him from seeing what God is doing and what God has done. And in the fourth verse, God challenges the anger. He says, Dost thou well to be angry? If you'd put it in the young blood vernacular, God is saying, So what do you think is right? Do you think it's right to be angry? You think it's okay to be angry at me is what God's saying? God's saying, okay, son, you can sit back and be hot-headed. You can be angry if you want to. Do you believe that's the right thing to do? Literally, God is saying, Jonah, your anger will not change the situation. Your anger is not going to change the circumstances. Multitudes of Christians, I believe, we all need to learn the lesson that we can get bent out of shape, but it's not going to change the circumstances and the situation. Only God can do that. And here is Jonah angry with the sovereign God that's doing what's being done, and yet Jonah is angry, bent out of shape. He's having a temper tantrum, and a temper tantrum won't change anything that's taken place. It won't change what has or will take place. God says, is it right for you to be angry over my decision to save Nineveh? Is it right for you to be angry over what I've done? May I remind us, it's never right to get angry over what God does, and God's in control. God is the one that's sovereign. God's the one that's in control of what takes place. Listen, perhaps you've heard this story. A little girl that had gotten angry with Mama because of what she was sassing back at Mom at the supper table. And Mom said, go up to your room. Don't want to hear anything from you until bedtime. And she goes up to the room. She's dead silent. <laughs> Mom's wondering what's happening. Have you heard that story? And Mom goes up and opens the door, and there's the little girl. Uh, she opens the door, and she opens the closet, and there's a the little girl standing in the closet just like this. And she said, what are you doing? And she said, I've spit on your shoes. I've spit on your dresses. I've spit on your sweaters. I've spit on everything in the closet. And I'm just waiting for more spit. <laughs> there are a lot of Christians that do that. 
We're angry with God, and as a result of being angry with God, we've simply run out of spit. We're waiting for more spit to spit on whatever it is we're trying to do because we're angry with what God's doing. Have you ever been in that point, place, and position where because you've lost a job, because you've lost a home, because you've lost a loved one, because you've lost a spouse, because there's something that's taken place in your home and your family that you cannot control, and you pray and you ask God to do it, and it seems like it's getting worse rather than better, and you get angry with God because God has not modified the situation or he's not modified it in any fashion. He's not helped you to get around it. You recall the story just a few years ago of those that were called the Menendez brothers. Most of us know that story. I think it was a 16 and a 17 year old uh, two lads and they were bent out of shape with mom and dad. You know why they were angry? It was something that was rarely pointed out in the elongated story and they've had the replay of that story of the Menendez brothers on television recently. They were bent out of shape because they went to mom and dad and they wanted to borrow the family's Mercedes to go out that evening on a date. And the parents said no. They historically, they had loaned the car. Historically, they'd allowed them to use the car. But for this particular time, occasion, for some reason, they said no. The two boys got angry with mom and dad. They determined we're going to retaliate because of the anger. And I don't know if you read the whole story or heard the whole story. They took a shotgun and went in and shot dad, double barrel shotgun. Went into the garage and there's mother and they shot one time and she was injured and not killed. She fell down on her knees profusely bleeding and holding them and begging them, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. And they unloaded the other barrel right in her head angry with their parents because of saying no to being able to use a vehicle. There are kids that get that angry today, and that same anger is bound up in the heart of every adult that's never said yes to Jesus Christ. And multitudes that are saved are angry with God because somehow, somehow, they think that God needs to be the little water boy that we can demand God. I'll never forget hearing an individual preacher on television some years ago, and he said, any time I don't have enough money, all I've got to do is hold up my checkbook and demand that God refill my account. That's saying, God, you're my water boy. God, you're the puppet. I'm the one that's sovereign. I'm the one that's in control. And Jonah's doing that very thing. He is angry with God, and his argument that is registered there is simply that he's saying, God, I'm angry with you because of what you've done. He is not looking at it that God's in control, and God's the one that's sovereign. Not only do we see the argument registered, but I want you to notice the apostasy reminded in that fifth verse. Notice the scripture says, and so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there was made him a booth, and he sat under it in the shadow till the, he might see what would become of the city. I want you to notice that apostasy that is reminded there. Jonah is so displeased with God. He's so angry with God. His response to uh, what God is doing is total anger. And Jonah here is cold. He's angry. He's callous. He's bitter. He's falling away. He cannot communicate with the Lord. The sin of anger will prevent any fellowship with the Lord. And that's what's happening. He don't have any, he doesn't have any more any fellowship with God. He doesn't have any communication with God. He's simply angry with God because of the circumstances in his life. I want us to notice. We see two things, the fickleness of anger and the folly of anger. He is not thinking straight. He is self-centered in his anger. May I remind us, anger will prevent any rational thinking. Anger, a person can be so angry, he will not think rationally in relationship to what he's doing. This is the reason you find all times in the heat of anger in a uh, domestic dispute in the home. A husband will kill the wife or the wife will kill the husband. And then 30 minutes later, an hour later, two hours later, they regret having done it. They realize it was because the white, hot, boiling anger in the heart that caused them to do it. It's fickleness that causes it. We see this in politics today. We see this in the social situations today. We see this in our homes today. We see this as the cause of rebellion and the children being rebellious in the home and the anger as a result of it. We see this in divorce in the homes and the families and it's anger. Perhaps the wife cooks the wrong biscuits or she burns the biscuits. The husband has been out of shape and he says, I'm going to divorce you. You go back to the Old Testament, that literally was taking place. The wife could burn the biscuits and the husband would get a divorce as a result of it. This is the reason divorce is sin, according to the Scripture, but sin can be forgiven, and I'm thankful that God tells us that. Not only do we see the fickleness of anger, but the folly of anger. Jonah is just going to sit, notice in the text, he's made a decision, I'm going to just disengage, I'm going to sit and do nothing. I'm going to sit back in comfort, I'm going to sit back in ease, I'm going to get me a shade tree, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm simply going to watch and see what God does. He preached 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. 
And he's going to sit and watch. And the idea behind the text that we see here, I'm going to just sit for 40 days and I'm going to see what God does. I'm going to watch what God, I'm not going to be involved. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just simply going to sit and see what happens. Someone said anger is progressive. Anger is possessive. Anger is paralyzing. And anger is poisonous, end quote. It comes to the full turn of simply being bitterness in the heart and the life of an individual. Jonah saying, I'm going to stop worshiping. I'm going to stop giving. I'm going to stop going. I'm just going to drop out on God. Now, we can talk about Jonah pretty easily, can't we? But when we look at it in the first person sense, it applies to every one of us. We have at some point and some time been in a position that we're so disappointed with what has happened that we want to blame someone or something or even in some circumstances blaming God for what has taken place, being angry with God. Now do we see the anger of Jonah revealed in verse 1, 2, and 3 and the apathy of Jonah reveal, reviewed in verse 4 and 5. But I want us to notice in verses 6 through 11 the bulk of the text, the arrogance of Jonah revealed. The arrogance of Jonah revealed. In these verses, we see the mercy, the grace, and the compassion of holy God. We see the anger and the apathy and the arrogance of Jonah. I want you to notice in that sixth verse what I call the awesome compassion recorded. The awesome compassion recorded. Notice in the scripture there, in the sixth verse of Jonah, the fourth chapter. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad for the gourd. Notice God calls it his grief. He's grieving and in that grief because of the turn of circumstances that he did not want. He is angry because of it. I want you to notice two things. I want you to notice God's provision and God's pity. God's provision and God's pity. Now listen very carefully. I said on a number of occasions, a lot of folks need to be glad I ain't God. Now, that's poor grammar, but it makes a point. God is God, and God still has mercy and compassion and pity, and he shows his love and mercy and grace. And here we see God's provision. Even when we are angry at God, even when there's a bitterness and an arrogance and a refusal to obey, God still loves us and provides for us. There's nothing a person can do that will prevent the love of God from being shown in his heart and his life. God loves us regardless of where we are. God loves us regardless of what we do. God loves us even in the midst of our sin. But God does not love the sin. This is the major differentiation that we find in society today where multitudes of people talk about, well, God loves me. That sodomite that's out there in a homosexual lifestyle, the attitude is every, all kinds of love is okay. No, it's not. That's not what the Word of God says. It's sin, and as a result of the sin, God is going to absolutely uh, be one that judges that sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Here's Jonah. He is sinning against God. He is angry at God, but God loves him, and in that love, he provides for him, even though Jonah is rebellious and angry toward God. Someone said, and it's poor grammar, but I make the statement, ain't God good? <laughs> We need to recognize the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. We see God's provision. We see God's pity. Notice the scripture says, to deliver him from his grief. God has compassion on him. God has pity on Jonah. Even undeserved, yet God's compassion and God's pity is new every day in Jonah's life. It's Jonah's selfish anger and arrogance that has put him in that position, yet God still reaches out in pity and in provision because he loves him. Wonderful text that illustrates that is Lamentation, chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. There are new, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You see, even in our unfaithfulness, God is faithful. Even in our anger, God loves us. Even in our disobedience, God reaches out in provision and pity for us today. That's a message that ought to be understood in every heart of every life and every individual, that God loves us, and in that love will provide for our needs, and in that love he will provide in pity and compassion for us. So Jonah, the scripture says, was exceeding glad of the gourd. 
Now, now he's not glad that folks got saved. He's glad that God provided out of pity for him that the sun would not scorch him and provided the gourd for him. May I remind us, Jonah received God's compassion gladly. Jonah received God's pity and compassion gladly, he, yet he is displeased over God's compassion for Nineveh. Displeased that others got saved, but he is absolutely glad and rejoicing that God, the same God that delivered those in Nineveh, the same God that delivered them because of the message of Jonah, that same God now is providing for Jonah, and Jonah rejoices in that, but he's angry that God has done something for others. The awesome compassion recorded. But I want us to notice in 7 and 8, the arrogant complaint responded. Notice the next day something changes. Notice the next day there's a total turnabout. Notice God's about to use Jonah's condition and Jonah's circumstances to teach Jonah a lesson. And many times in the midst of the storm, we do not fathom, we cannot understand, we cannot look beyond the present tense of what is taking place to see beyond today, see beyond tomorrow of the long story, the long haul, as some calls it, of what God is doing in our lives. Notice two things. God prepared a worm and God prepared a wind. It's God's doing. Notice the scripture says in that seventh verse, but... It's a contrast, a different direction. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. It's God that destroyed Jonah's shade. It's God that placed Jonah in the position that he's in. It's God that placed uh, uh, Jonah where he, he sat and uh, watching Nineveh to see what's going to take place. Jonah will not be able to just sit back and not do anything. God's putting it in a position that he's, if you put it in the vernacular, God's pulling the rug out from under him. God is making a move that will make Jonah do something other than just sitting in lethargy and apathy in what God is doing. He is forcing Jonah to recognize that it's God that's in control. It's God that's in the, on the throne. It's God that makes the decisions and not we ourselves. Jonah will not be able to just sit back. God knows how to get our attention. We ever notice that? You don't have to say amen or oh me. <laughs> but God knows how to get our attention. I don't care where we are, who we are, what we're doing. God knows exactly how to get our attention. We might think that somehow, some way we can be angry at God. We might think that somehow, some way we can sit back and do nothing. There are multitudes of folks today that are doing nothing in the household of faith. I never will forget an individual that said something about he was angry with God because he, uh, as one of the deacons, he was not recognized as being uh, the uh, top deacon. He was not recognized as being uh, the one that had the most gracious spirit. Uh, some others were recognized. He was angry. He said, I'm not going to serve anymore because they didn't get recognized. There are a lot of folks today in the Christian community that because they're not uh, recognized and praised and patted on the back and the name's written up in some marquee or bullet in some place, they're angry with the church, angry with those other believers. They're angry with God and somehow, some way, want to say, I'm not going back anymore. I'm not going to serve the Lord anymore. I don't care what's happened in your life. I don't, it doesn't make any difference how deep the problem, how deep the pain, how dark the day might have been. God is still able to work through that because it's God that it must come through God's hand before it can touch our lives and God's doing it for his glory and for our good and whatever may take place. God prepared a worm and then God prepared a wind. Notice in verse 8, And it came to pass when the sun was... Uh, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement wind, that is heavy, strong wind, eastward wind, and the sun beat upon the heat head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished himself to die. Every time he turned around, Jonah said, I want to die. Every time we turn around in the text, we see Jonah finding that, uh, if you please, that cop out that I just want to die. Wring my hands. Oh, poor little pitiful me. I just want to die. God, just let me die. God, kill me. Get me out of this life. He fainted, the scripture said, and wished, to, wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. I just made a little margin note. Wow. Wow. The wind and the worm, the sun beating heat, and Jonah's anger builds up to the boiling point once again. Somehow, some way, Jonah doesn't understand that God's still at work. He says, I just wish I could die. Ponder for a moment, have you ever gotten to the point of dissipation, discouragement, and heartache that you've said, I'd just rather die than face this pain? How many have said, I don't think I can take another day? 
I don't think I can take another pain. I don't believe I can take another problem. I don't believe I can do it and go another mile. I don't believe I can open another door. I don't believe it on and on and on I could go with the analogy. How many times have we reached that point that we come to what we call the end of the rope, the end of the way, and we say, God, I can't take it anymore. Well, God knows exactly what you can handle and what I can handle, and he knows exactly what's needed to get our attention to look to him and honor him and serve him in submission and surrender. Jonah says, I just don't want to live. God wants us to realize that whatever happens in life, he's still in control. He's still on the throne. Whatever happens, good or bad or indifferent, must come through the hand of God. There's nothing that can effectuate anything in your life or mine, but that it first must come through the hand of God. Study the book of Job, and you realize that here is Satan in a table conference with God. And Satan says, look at your servant Job. He's, uh, he is one that's a good guy, but it was God that made mention of Job. He's a perfect and upright man. He eschews evil, and he serves me. And Satan says, oh, but yeah, you've got a hedge built around him. You take that hedge down, let me in, he'll curse you to your face and die. You remember the story. God said, okay, I'm going to open the, open the hedge, let you get in. Satan went in, and he affected everything in Job's life. He took his health, he took his fame, he took his fortune, he took his family, he took his flock. And even at that, his wife walked in and said, why don't you curse God and die? He said, what, woman, if I can put it in the vernacular, do we accept good from the hand of God and not bad? We need to understand that there are good days and bad days, and in every event, whatever it may be, God is still on the throne. God is still working. God is still sovereign. God is still in control. Nothing has gone out of control with the hand of God. And that's what Jonah is finding here, and that's what God is teaching us through this. We need to understand that God allows the trials and the troubles and the tribulation and the tests to come in our lives to strengthen us. There's an old poem or a song, whichever it may be. I think it's a song. It says, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in God. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to depend upon his word. I'd rather, if I never had a problem, I'd never know that he could solve them. And that's what it is in our lives. If we didn't have any problems, if there weren't any trials and tribulations and difficulties, we would never recognize that God is the one that's sovereign. He's the one that's on the throne. He's the one that controls each and every one of our lives and what we face each day. Not only we see the awesome compassion recorded and the arrogant complaint responded, but I want you to notice the Almighty's, we're talking about God, the Almighty's challenge reminded in verse 9, 10, 11. Notice in verse 9 what I call the challenge. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. He wants to die again. <laughs> again, God challenges Jonah. Do you think it's right to be angry because of the gourd? He was bent out of shape with God because the people turned to God in Nineveh. Then God provided the gourd. God provided a worm to cut the gourd so that it would die. God provided the east wind that he would be in the sun-scorched day. And God provided all of that. And God provided it in his provision and his pity, that is, compassion for Jonah. And yet here's Jonah that's now angry with God because the gourd died. And he no more had a shelter. And God says... Do you think it's okay to be angry over that little thing? And it's not okay for me to save those in Nineveh? Do you believe that somehow, some way, it's rational for you to think that I ought not to do what I want to do? Most Christians today are happy and praising the Lord as long as it is well with them. But uh, let the winds come. Let the worms eat the gourd, if you please. Let the winds blow and allow the needs to set in. And many will, just as Jonah, blame God with anger and hostility toward God. The challenge, God says, do you think it's okay to be angry because of what I've done? Do we believe that there's anything in society, anything in your life or mine, that warrants being angry at God? Not one single thing. We need to praise him in the rain and the sunshine. We need to praise him and thank him in the good days and the bad days. We need to praise him and thank him regardless of what tomorrow might hold. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds all of our tomorrows. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Not only we see the challenge, but notice the comparison in verse 10. Notice in the 10th verse what the scripture says, a wonderful two verses that wraps up the study. Notice in the 10th verse, 
Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for that which thou had not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. Listen to what God is saying to Jonah. He is saying there, as he reminds Jonah, that Jonah had pity on the gourd. Jonah had pity on what had taken place, but he did not recognize the hand of God in that doing. He's saying, if you will, you're angry for the gourd, and you're angry at God for sparing Nineveh. God is showing Jonah that his anger is foolish, misplaced, misguided anger. Jonah did nothing to produce the gourd. Jonah did nothing to make it grow. Jonah did nothing but simply obedient to God because it's God through the work of the Holy Spirit that did the saving and the delivering of all of those in Nineveh. God is saying to Jonah, son, you have no right to be angry. He's saying, son, you have no right to be angry enough, angry enough to uh, turn away from what I've called you to do. No right to be angry over Nineveh turning from sin to salvation. You're not right in your pity for the gourd and not for those in Nineveh. Let's do a little analogy from the 21st century humanity of us all. We get angry over things that we ought not to get angry over. And we fail to be angry over the things that we ought to be angry for. It ought to get us ticked off, angry <laughs> at what's happening in society today. Angry that we see right being dissipated and called wrong. We ought to be angry when we see sin prevalent in society where you can murder a human being in the womb. We ought to be angry and call it sin and stand up and say to our leadership, no more, we're not going to allow it in America. We ought to be angry over the LGBTQ agenda and what they're wanting to do in destroying the morals and the ethics and the values and the recruitment of our kids on the street, bringing them into a lifestyle that will destroy them for all of their future. We ought to be angry if you put it in the young blood vernacular, ticked off, bent out of shape over that. And yet here's Jonah that's angry over the wrong things. We see the challenge and the comparison, but I want you to notice in that 11th verse, the contrast. Notice what God says, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six, thor, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? God is saying, Jonah, listen carefully, son. I have delivered about a million and a half people in the city of Nineveh. And out of that, about 120,000 that are immature enough, they don't know the right hand from the left. That's talking about the kids, the children. Could be toddlers, could be teenagers, whatever it may be, that are not discerning any spiritual truth. And God says to Jonah, he says to Jonah, the vine, the gourd are insignificant. Nineveh was far more important. Nineveh had more than 120,000 children and over a million people plus much cattle. See, God is saying to Jonah, the loss of the gourd is insignificant, but the saving of over a million people are the significant things that you ought to be concerned about. We have displaced loyalties in America today. We have displaced our priorities in our nation today. And that displacement of our priorities in our nation, it causes us, even as Christians, to look after and to follow after and be involved in that which the world is doing rather than that which the Word of God says that we ought to do and we ought to be submissive and, and uh, obedient unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ in that. He's saying that over a million souls is great and more important than a vine. God is saying to Jonah, be careful of what you get angry over. Be careful of what you find that you call tragedy. And I just made a little footnote. What a tragic scenario when God's people care more for the comfort and uh, the uh, relaxation that is found in society today than the compassion for souls. We're concerned about having the proper car, the proper house, the proper clothing, the proper food, etc., etc., etc. We're more concerned about that than over that soul that's going to die and go to a devil's hell because we've not reached out with the gospel of Jesus Christ and shared the good news that God loves you, God cares for you, Jesus Christ died for you. That ought to be the compassion and the message on the heart and the life and the tongues and the lips of every child of God. We ought to recognize that God loves us and wants for the, us the very best. Whatever God does in your life, whatever God does in my life, he's doing that for his honor and for his glory and for our good. How should we respond to a message like this? What ought to be the response from the heart and the life 
of the child of God. We need to go back and examine our priorities. What causes us to be angry? Are we angry over the right things? Or have we got displaced, misplaced priorities in life today? I'm here to tell you, if we focus on what God's doing, we simply praise him and thank him in advance, whatever it may be. Lord, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but whatever it is, I thank you in advance. I know it's for my good and for your glory, and thank you for it in Jesus' name. That ought to be our prayer. That ought to be our mindset. That ought to be our heartbeat. That doesn't mean that what happens tomorrow we're going to look at in the short term as being, man, I'm so glad I hit my finger with the hammer. You know, that's not what I'm talking about at all. There's some folks that misunderstand that. You don't smash your thumb and they say, oh, thank you, Jesus. That's not what I'm saying at all. But whatever happens, God is in control. God is sovereign. Let us understand that and grasp that. Jonah didn't understand it. And as a result of that, he got angry with God. Would you say?